and onwards to Tintin. There is only one word to describe this ancient cradle of religion. Magnificent. Tintin Abbey, one of the great Cistercian monastic houses, the second to be built in Britain and the first in Wales. Writers, artists, poets, tourists and kings, all who visit never fail to be inspired, impressed, in search of the romantic, or as our intrepid 18th century Wye Valley tour travelers in whose footsteps we are treading, the picturesque. I came here to this quiet valley in the year of 1793. Turner had come here before me the previous year, but his works had not yet been exhibited. I stopped here at the remains of this 14th century landing stage from which the ferry departed to cross the river. I sought here a peace and tranquility which I found amongst these woods and amongst the ruins of the abbey itself, which reminded me so greatly of a forest made of stone. Its pillars and columns were covered with ivy and with moss. Birds flew freely through the windows and amidst the rubble that had fallen from its walls, small and beautiful flowers were growing. No wonder then that others soon followed me. Turner the artist returned, as did Coleridge the poet and many others to this place of quiet and tranquility here in the Wye Valley. With its chapter house and breathtaking Gothic church, this ruined pile, as it was once described, is on everyone's itinerary when they visit Britain. Its glorious setting, one of the finest monastic sites in Britain. On the 9th of May, 1131, a little group of French monks from the Abbey of La Monde near Chartres arrived at this then remote spot to begin building their church and following the rules of Saint Benedict. These monks came from the upper classes and so manual labor came as a bit of a shock to them. Lay brothers eventually provided most of the labor for their first small wooden church, whilst the choir monks divided their day into three parts, one third for labor, cultivating the fields and granges, one third for prayers inside the church, and the final third for divine reading. The church you see now was effectively completed in the mid-13th century, but even up to the time of the dissolution of the monasteries by the great destroyer Oliver Cromwell in 1537, additions were still being made. Here in the warming house was the only fire in the abbey outside the kitchens and the infirmary and possibly the abbot's quarters. Um, this is where you came to warm, a huge fire, and you could get all the way around it. And it was a sort of common room, a gathering place. Of course, you weren't allowed to talk to anybody, but then the signing language would come in quite well. The bleeding took place here. Three times a year, the, each monk was bled uh, to relieve the vapours. Um, life in the Middle, middle Ages was um, considered to be constructed of the four humours, fire, water, earth and air. So to bleed was to relieve the humours. Here in the refectory, our Lord Abbot, John of Wisbeach, would have presided at high table on a great dais. This was the main meal of the day. Next to him sat the prior, the cellarer, the infirmarer, whichever obedientary was able to come to the main meal. The other monks would have sat at tables going that direction. The least important monk sitting near the door. Over here is the pulpit, the pulpit, not the pulpitum. The pulpitum is the great screen in the church. And from this, a monk would have read from the scriptures during the meal so that the monks were encouraged to listen and learn while they were eating. Served through here, of course, was a typical meal of the day. Vegetarian, of course, no meat. Meat was eaten in the infirmary. So eggs, pottage, bread, vegetables, fruit, and beer. I'm now sitting in the cloister. On the south side of the cloister, the work side. The cloister was the hub of the whole abbey. This is where the work took place. And I'm sitting in the abbot's seat, where 
Just before Vespers in the evening, we choir monks gathered around our abbot to hear one of our number read from the lives of the Cistercian Fathers, St Bernard or St Stephen, St Eldred. And then there would be a discussion and a debate and then food would be served, bread, cheese and beer. Remembering, of course, that each monk had a quota of eight pints of beer a day. The life of the Abbey endured for 400 years until Master Thomas Cromwell, the servant of King Henry VIII, came on the 3rd of September, 1536, to take the keys from our abbot, John Witch, a very pious man. There were 12 monks with Abbot Witch. The same number of monks who came to this spot on the 9th of May, 1131. Occasionally, a sonne lumiere is held on a warm summer's evening. With hundreds of local people involved in telling the Abbey's story, it is a very impressive sight indeed. Two milk-white stags appeared, drawing a hearse. Teldrick, faint from his death blow, was lifted up, and the stags moved off as if led by an unseen hand. <laughs> 